Welcome, dear friends, to Kardec Radio. We are here live at 11 p.m., nourishing our souls together and the mercy of on high, bringing us together, joining forces all over the world so we can focus on the beauty of hope. We are here to lift up our hopes. This is Lifting Hope based on the book Memoirs of a Suicide. Memoirs of a Suicide is the book that was mediumistically written by Von Pereira, a Brazilian medium who received this information in a non-traditional way. And I say non-traditional because usually it's automatic writing or psychography. And she says, no, I didn't receive this information through psychography. I actually felt it, I visualized it, I heard it, and I put it down. So the spirit author is Camilo Botelho, who in fact is the, suno, it's the pseudonym of the spirit, Camilo Castelo Branco, who was a Portuguese writer who lived in the 18th century, and he killed himself because he became blind. He couldn't take it. And it was very difficult for him. He was very prolific. In that incarnation, he wrote more than 200 books. So here comes Leon Denis as the other illuminated spirit who comes and does the revision to bring to us greater teachings that illuminate us. This book is very comprehensive regarding teachings. It's a book that has so many teachings. It's so deep that it talks deeply about our souls. Today, we're studying chapter nine, which is titled, The Archives of the Soul. Mm, so many teachings in this chapter. It's so fascinating that it gives us instructions for us to live a better life. Are you ready? Yes, I can see friends coming along. Welcome, welcome, dear souls. I see Jailton coming here. Am I right, Jailton? Welcome to Kardec Radio. Rosalind Rosa, Sunshine, Daisy Gallen. I can see you. I see Paula. Hello, Paula. I see Raquel Bakeshi. People are coming in. Andrea Torres, big hug to you, Andrea. I've been thinking of you. Carol Correa, my dear friend, how have you been? Thank you. So this chapter, I remember talking to friends at SSVA about this chapter, some information. Carol Correa and I give a talk, which is at Kardec Radio, and she explained the case that we're going to go through today. It's beautiful. I know it's intense, but the beauty of it all is that we're never abandoned. I think that's the, the most hopeful part of it. Throughout this book, it's all about hope, 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 hope. No matter the worst we've done, we're always being rescued, cared for. And this chapter in particular is the living proof of it. Are you ready? Yes. You remember that in the previous chapter, we were studying before Camilo and his friends went to the next part of their treatment, which was to be instructed about the science of the spirit. He was allowed with some of his friends to go through the several sectors of the hospital. So they were visiting the watchtower, right? And they were visiting specific sections. So here we have it. I see Rihanna, Lisa Telles, welcome friends, welcome, welcome. So this chapter specifically is so intense. It begins by quoting one of the commandments in Exodus chapter 10, item 12, honor your father and your mother, one of the 10 commandments. They say that the begun was beginning to set the shadows were growing longer on the leaden horizon of the gloomy region. We went to the next floor down, and in doing so, I risked a question. So, 
Camilo Botelho is going to ask a question that probably you have in mind and I do too. Father Anselmo, who was the coordinator of this section, forgive my wanting to know all the details of a matter that speaks so strongly to my Christian sentiments and my concerns as a learner. Let's see if you have the same question. How do the directors of this magnanimous institution find out that spirits who committed suicide have gone missing and are being held prisoners by hostile hordes? You remember that in the previous chapter we got to know that depending on how we feel, we may be taken by groups of bad spirits who take us to gloomy regions and abuse us. It's, it, it's terrible. So he is asking, how do the directors of the institution know which suicides are not in the value of suicides and instead are under the harassment of these obsessing groups? What is the answer? Hmm? What is the answer? <clears throat> Father Anselmo begins by saying the following. Hmm? We have promised Jesus that we would, be his, we would be his aides on his mission of redemption by affiliating ourselves with the legion sponsored by this vener his venerable mother. Consequently, there are technicians in this watchtower whose job it is, is to look for the missing by using these infallible devices you saw just a while ago. Each of them has specific regions to score. Moreover, now, afflicted by remorse, former obsessors who have been regenerated under our care and made members of the militiamen willingly came forward to disclose the places they know about the invisible or on the earth where the victims of the oppressive persecution are gathered and where the worst atrocities are being committed. Once confirmed, these places are visited and cleansed. Usually, however, such information and orders come from the higher realms from the magnanimous assistance of the pious mother of humanity, the governors of our religion. If the suffering entities are not under the direct care of hers, the guardian of the legion to which they belong can ask for the assistance on their behalf because there is fraternal solidarity among the various groups of the sidereal universe. Moreover, no matter how disgraced or forgotten suicides may be, there's always someone who loves them and takes a sincere interest in their destiny by f directing prayers to Mary on their behalf. So, it, this is beautiful. Nobody is lost. Remember the previous chapter. Jesus said he would never allow one of his sheep to be lost. He would stop everything to go after that one. And now we are joining forces. We need to do the same. Go after. Find out. And help everybody, not only that person. So, for you and I, we need to know that past affections, old friends forgotten due to reincarnation, loved ones who accompanied them in past lives, their guardian angel who knows all their steps as well as their thoughts and who will assist them with true displays of fraternal love by the love of God. These are the people who will be helping. Plus, it's almost like the movies we see, right? And even in our society nowadays, those who are former obsessors, they come and to help out, they tell where those things happen, the location. And they tell the spirits and they go there and, and they're able to help.
cleanse that area of the earth. Okay. If the plea is directed to Mary, immediate orders are expedited to her messengers and then distributed to various outposts and institutes of suicide assistance maintained by the Legion. The workers are informed about the present activities surrounding the sufferer. His name, his or her name, nationality, date and place of death and the type of suicide. You, did you observe they say nationality? Because it's across the, across the world. Nationality. So they are not. this is not only about one particular nation for the whole planet. Mother Mary is in charge of the whole planet in this type of work. Even the nations that seem not to know of her existence. But as I said to you at the very beginning, Mother Mary is respected across the board in different cultures. In the Hindu culture especially, she comes close to the goddess level in the Hindu tradition. Okay? So, <clears throat> the workers are informed armed this with this information, they can go and get to know where they are. Wherever the individual is, he or she will be found no matter what it takes. No matter what it takes. Friends, we're talking about people working hard to rescue us when we commit a crime. Now, you may be asking, how come? But when you love someone, when you love someone, you go to hell to help this person, right? You do. They do too. So that's what we're talking about. People who go through extremes. There are even spirits they are describing in this chapter from these works who go undercover into these regions to rescue. They go through problems, but they remain faithful to find that suicide. It's an order from on high that they are rescued. Unbelievable. I think this is so beautiful. But you're going to see that the rule of thumb here is this. If they have one person who is praying for them? One. It doesn't take two, three, a million. One person who sincerely cares. It's enough for the request to be put and for the action to be taken. What is this? Mercy, love, compassion. I think you and I need to boost our hope. You and I have piles of guilt, right, from previous lives. Who doesn't read the book Thought in Life? He talks about guilt in one chapter, saying that inevitably, in a reincarnation, we're going to bump into guilt. Because we make mistakes. We made them. We make them. But you think God is going to punish us? Look at the history of Jesus. Everybody was casting a stone on Mary Magdalene. And time and again, he was breaking all the protocols, even after death, showing up to her first, not to his mother, not to Peter, his BFF, no, to Mary Magdalene. Later, he comes to Saul of Tarsus and says, Saul, come on, come with me. He empowers Saul who committed a lot of crimes to once he's changed, he has a shift in his mind, he empowers Saul, who turned to be Paul of Tarsus, to bring the good news to the world. It means 
that no matter the wrong you do and that I do, we're loved. We're not more loved as the Pharisees think if we keep our lives in the little things like, oh, I'm not doing anything wrong. I grew up and I get married and I have children, da da da. And I'm so I'm so beautiful before God. But you're not more beautiful than the people who are in jail. For God, them and you are important in the same way. Some people don't like when they hear that because they want to think that they are more than others. But you know what? At the end of the day, God loves us equally because God is fair, just. He created you and I, and he loves us the same. So that's when you feel guilty. You look at yourself in the mirror and say, I am a child of God. God loves me, and that's it. God knows we are fighting our bad tendencies. The big deal here is not to not have problems, but it's to master managing them. Because on earth, there are no angels. Okay? No angels. The only one that incarnated was Jesus. The rest of them, no angels. Not even Chico Xavier. He was never considered to be an angel, though we think he was very angelic. But angel is something we cannot even grasp. None of these books talk about angelic realms. They talk only about colonies that are in the surrounding of the earth. We barely have information of places like Jupiter, Venus, Mars. Barely, barely, barely. Why? Because on earth, we are to be human beings. And what is to be a human being? What is to be human? To be human is different than being an animal. What is the difference? Because this chapter, it's all about becoming human. When we are animal, it's fair that everything is very instinctive. Our intelligence is at instinctive level. When we become human, we gain. We gain. Consciousness, we gain the responsibility of communication, free will. So what is the big deal as humans? To learn to think before we act. Leave the realm of reactivity, of instinctiveness. We need first discipline and then spontaneity. In animal levels, it's very instinctive. In our level, we need to think before we say something, before we do something, before we feel something, before anything. And that's the biggest deal for us to be humans. Different from animals. At animal level, if a dog barks, the other one may bark just because. Now, at human level, if somebody says something, not necessarily we should say something else just because they said it. That's the difference. Being human means that we need to grow intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually. That we're going to put reasoning before instinct. Reasoning comes first. Okay, so let's say at animal level, for example, I have a little fish. The fish doesn't need it to eat much, no. But if you see the fish, every time it observes you around, it wants something. And if you keep feeding, you may push it to death sooner than you imagine, because they're going to eat it. That's the instinct. Like a dog, if you keep putting food, they're going to keep eating, 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 right? They may stop, but then go back, and then they're going to gain weight. At human level, we are learning that we can't. 
because there's food in the fridge doesn't mean we're going to go there and eat whenever we want. We need to think, do I really need it? I have just eaten. Do I need more calories? Do I need more vitamins? Do I need more? What does my body need at this point? More water? A specific type of vitamin or mineral or protein? So I need to observe my physical body and care to the point that I know what it needs without indulging. This is human. A human is able to rest properly. Animals, they just rest. We do the intelligent sleep. Differences. In this chapter, we're going to learn that there are spirits who are still so close to the animal level but not the happy animal level. Because as humans, we make huge mistakes when we keep being animalistic, commit true crimes, and we deter our march to progress. We delay it. You want to see it? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you. So, <clears throat> oh. Usually, if the spirit, the suicidal spirit, has not been captured by wicked hordes of obsessors that had persecuted him or her before the suicide, the work will be easy. However, if the task is arduous and thorny, we need the help of personal or personnel outside the Legion. We have the right to ask for the assistance and we are promptly served. There are also cases where we even need to have the help of lower order spirits, that is, of groups of spirits that are below the level of morality and enlightenment. But if the plea is addressed to another eminent spirit, it will be referred to Mary nonetheless. And the same measures will apply because, as we have been repeating, Mary is the sublime guardian of suicide spirits. Hmm? Okay? Now, in any event, a prayer, as you have seen, conveyed with love and fervor on behalf of a suicide, is the sacred vehicle that carries invaluable consolations. Read the book Heaven and Hell, Right Sunshine, every Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Sunshine is explaining cases of the book Heaven and Hell by Kardec, amongst them suicide spirits. You know, we have previous programs, and you can go there and see it. And the prayer is sacred. It brings celestial mercies to the poor wretch at any time. It is one of the beneficial elements of the assistance established by the law for those who suffer. Okay? All right. Okay. The work is vast. He says, if suicidal people just thought of all these works that are done when people commit suicide, they would probably think of the how much work they are giving to these guardian angels and the superior spirits and would probably not do it. That's what he says. Okay, Father Anselmo. And he finishes by saying that they can rescue and take them to consoling shelters watched over by hope, Mother Mary. So they go to this specific tower that was very gloomy. And they say, Father Sam says, here lives fearsome obsessors, leaders of weak, dark phalanxes who were suicides but also committed horrible crimes under the divine law, pushing people also to the abyss of suicide. Camilo said that he thought that these spirits were like monsters, but he was so surprised when he got in, he got to know that they were not. He entered and he saw that it wasn't a prison per se. It was like an educational institute 
with educational apparatuses and everything that was ideal to help educate the minds of these spirits who were the darkest. Mm -hmm. Hold on, I'm just turning the pages, okay? Breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. Now, Father Anselmo is looking at Camilo and the friends and saying, come with me. You can use your remote viewing equipment to see what is happening now. So, they start seeing small rooms of study and things that were quite comfortable not to shock the prisoners, inviting them to reflection, meditation, study, silence. You know, friends, as we said in previous chapters, silence is so healing, but not this silence of indifference, because nowadays many people play silence, like the silent treatment, which is very hurtful. We're talking about the silence that avoids spreading the mental bacteria of despair, of sadness. Have we been practicing it? Because we talk so much in our society, especially in the Western world. So funny, our Western world abuses the word. We, we cannot you know, contain ourselves enough, we need to practice it for our own benefit. So, they have educational guidelines of the laws of love and fraternity there. And these moral delinquents that are there, okay, they need to raise their consciousness regarding what they've done. So they are bringing these obsessors to find repentance. Repentance is very positive. If we do not regret the wrongdoings, we, we're not going to regenerate ourselves. By recognizing, realizing that we have done something wrong, we go to the next step in the pathway of a reparation, right? Some people are afraid of repenting because they think they're going to feel so guilty and ashamed that they don't even go there. They're like, no, 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 but I did it because, but I did it because, and we're going to see a case like this. You want to see? I'll tell you. Father Anselmo points out to a male figure, okay, on the magnetic screen. He was around 40 years old. 40. He says, this is one of those fearsome obsessors, the leader of a small phalanx hard, of hardened and evil entities, the bearer of multiple vices and moral degradations, a criminal and a suicide, who dragged into his abyss of vileness and misery all the careless incarnates and discarnates he was able to lure away to follow him. His crimes against the divine laws are so serious that we would not be surprised if he we received an order from on high to hand him over to competent channels for an expiatory reincarnation on a planet less evolved than the earth. You think these big time criminals on earth will be allowed to reincarnate on earth? I don't think so. Now in the transition, this is it. If you make a huge mistake, another planet. Because we can no longer afford the reincarnation of people who do not want to regenerate themselves. It's sad to say, because maybe our loved ones are there. Hopefully, we will not go there. But it depends on what we do with the rest of our lives. Right? Law of action and reaction. Mary interceded before 
her son on behalf of this his wretch. So you see, Mother Mary asked Jesus for permission to help this man. Agenor Penalva, this is his name. While recommending to us the utmost patience and deepest expressions of charity and love we could possibly muster in this lamentable case. So, although he is a prisoner, he constantly receives all the spiritual, moral, and even physical assistance that his animalized and forced nature requires. So, you may be asking, the method, right? He says, our methods include another strict and forceful type of teaching that only initiates can use because it requires a special skillful technique. Consequently, it's always entrusted to a specialized person who is one of the most popular in our colony, Dr. Olivier de Guzman, whom you know as a director of security. He has taken on highly intricate responsibilities. No good worker is kept idle in the Lord's vineyard, but there is scarcity of workers. This is a pause we're going to make because sometimes on earth, people want to help and they think just because they want to help, they go start helping people like that. Sometimes we need to defer the help to people who are more specialized than us. There are cases in which we cannot help at all. Why? I, as a, as a psychologist, some people come and say, Vanessa, can you help? I say, I can't, because this person needs somebody who is specialized in this case. Not because I don't want to, but professionally speaking, we need to recognize that the specialties are very beneficial. In the higher realms, they also delegate certain specific tasks to people who are more skillful. We need to have that humility because sometimes we think we can do everything and we're just doing harm. When we defer this person, refer this person to somebody who is more specialized, the success may be great and faster. We can't do it all. This is practice of humility. Okay? All right. So, Olivier de Guzman is the special person. Okay? So, you may be asking, what does it happen? I'm going to summarize to you a little bit. I'll read some parts, but summarize to you. So, Olivier de Guzman was visiting... Agenor Penalva, who is a former suicide and obsessor, a criminal, who has been in the Institute for 38 years, but now he's being subjected to this treatment. So he was greeted very kindly by Olivier de Guzman, who comes in and says, may the peace of the Lord be with you, Agenor Penalva. But Agenor Penalva didn't respond. Amazing. Huh? The loving master motioned for him to sit down while he himself remained standing. So he was very paternal and he said, you, there is a notebook. And the lesson was about honoring father and mother. He then is brought, okay, he's brought to an area where there's a screen. He needs to project his thoughts of his memories. So the lesson is, Agenor Penalva, how did you treat your parents in the last reincarnation? And, he, you know, he starts by saying this. Hold on. <clears throat> okay. Okay. He starts saying here, I have been a good son. I was a good son. I love my parents. Da da dee, da da da. And then I, the technician, the director, 
Father um, Olivier de Guzman says, really? Somebody who is listening to you, Arjun or Penalva, may think that you are a victim. But I know you. That's how he talks. You know, on earth, we're so childish, we're so sensitive. I love this book because it's the true therapy for the soul. We need to handle it. We're not going to change if somebody keeps patting our head and sugarcoating. We need people who love us and say, face it, face it, face it. Yes, we need people who say, come on, you can do better. Enough with this postponing. And that's exactly the attitude of Olivier de Guzman, okay? <clears throat> he says, no, Master, not at all. I was not a bad son to my parents. What I told you about that aspect of my life is true, I swear. And then he talks and talks and he says the terrible things that happened to him as if he were a victim. And then Olivier de Guzman said with sincerity but serenity is someone else had to listen to your constant complaining Ajanor. they might think that terrible injustices were being committed on these premises illuminated by the sublime protection of the magnanimous director of our legion but needless to say the long string of misfortunes you have just described originated from the sinful excesses of your own acts and the truculence of the primitive instincts you still harbor. For 38 years, you have been patiently exhorted to reform yourself on the inside. Doing so would assure you of less afflictive situations. However, you have systematically refused to make any effort to grow spiritually and to have kept yourself locked up in the ill will of a pride that has been poisoning your spirit by keeping it from taking any steps on the path of progress that you should have started out on a long time ago. We have been very patient with you, even though you haven't realized it. You know good and well that your containment within our protective circle is keeping you from being taken captive by the phalanx of obsessors that you yourself used to lead. And you also know that you yourself are responsible for the freedom you desire so much. You have never been mistreated here. We offer you spiritual treasures each and every day. And then he keeps talking and talking and talking and talking and talking. And then he brings him to the camera and says, let us examine your merits as a son. They will all be fully credited to you and will thus mitigate your future reparations. Agenor Penalva, sitting in front of this screen under this magnetic canopy, it is going to photograph your thoughts and memories. Go back in time to when you were five years old in your last existence. Remember all you did regarding your parents, especially your mother. Your actions will parade before you and you'll be judged by your own conscience, which will now receive a powerful echo from the reality of the past. It cannot evade it because it has been faithfully and meticulously stored in the imperishable folds of your immortal soul. Like all extremely guilty spirits, Agenor immediately tried to escape. No, sir, my master, please, I beg you, let me go back to my room so I can prepare myself better. Olivier de Guzman said, sit down, Agenor Penalva, I command you. He sat down. Held, everybody was watching and holding their breath. Olivier's demeanor had become profoundly grave, as if concentrating his mental powers to his their highest degree. He enveloped Agenor's head in a luminous translucent white band that came from the solar light itself. The band was like a garland and was tied to the canopy that covered the chair with luminous 
imperceptible wires. Then the screen. Agenor Penalva, you are now five years old and living in your parents' house on the outskirts of Malaga. You are the only son of an honest, happy couple. Your parents dream of preparing a brilliant future for you. They are deeply religious and are living examples of their upstanding virtues. They cherish the idea of consecrating you to God, of having you wear the castle. Awakening the folds of your soul, your conduct as a son toward your parents, especially your mother. Do it now. You're in the presence of God. So he starts seeing the things. So now Camilo summarizes to us, and I'm going to summarize to you, bullet points he makes about Agenor. It's interesting that this case begins when he's five years old. You know why? Because nowadays, many parents, they don't observe the minimal tendencies that they can see from an early age. If they could see it, they could help, but they don't. So it's beautiful because it shows to us you can recognize a a soul and the tendencies from the get-go. So Agenor Penalva had been a rebellious son from early youth with no tenderness or respect for his parents. He never acknowledged the kindness that they bestowed on him. He felt that his parents were his slaves and it was their duty to serve him and prepare a future for him. He, the son, was the master. How many children are the masters of their parents at home? We need to say no. We need to educate them. We can't allow children to rule parents' lives. Not because of the case of authority or power struggle, but we're not helping. Look what happens when we don't tame the child from the get-go. He was not kind. If you see your child being unkind, we need to trim it down. How? Consequences. Tell them, look, for every action there is a reaction. If you do it one more time, there will be consequences. Not only you are not going to watch a cartoon, not only this, but if you do right, there will be rewards. Both. It's a balance. But we need to educate the soul. It's hard work. I think the hardest work we can ever do is being a parent. It's the hardest of all. Hardest. And I cannot even imagine what it is to be a parent of a super low order spirit. I cannot imagine. It must be very hard. That's why we need support for parents. Parents need a lot of support. Inside the home, he was despotic, hostile, irreverent, cruel. He was benevolently likable. Outside in the streets, he was kind, affable. He refused to correct himself. Okay. He wanted a, an easy future for him. He was very ambitious, resentful because he had a humble beginning. So he decided not to say where he came from. He was inclined to a military career. Okay. He had worldly aspirations. He was ashamed of his humble beginnings. And uh, he dropped his paternal last name, Penalva for a fictitious one, because he didn't feel like it was prestigious. And he proclaimed himself to be descendant of crusade generals and noble knights who were freed, who freed Spain from the Arab yoke. He had never visited his father during his long illness. And after the father died, he left his mother without any means of support. He took all of her possessions and the money she had saved up for long old age 
leaving her behind in the countryside. He caused her to shed the tears of disillusionment and she was without protection and care, leaving her in humiliation under the care of distant relatives and who considered her a burden. He refused to receive her in his home in Madrid. Unbelievable. He was home with important people and he didn't want them to see his simple, humble mother. Because she, the mother, continued to beg for his protection, he secretly moved her to Portugal. He sent her to live with a paternal uncle who supposedly lived in Oporto, but he did not check to see if he still lived there, which in fact he did not. Consequently, his mother was unable to locate her brother-in-law and got lost in the Portuguese soil, finding shelter with some compassionate fellow, fellow Spaniards. So he was bad for his mother, for the mother, for the father. So he sailed to Americas, abandoning even his wife in false promises. And once he was there, he seduced, dishonored, and even induced to suicide a poor, simple girl. Completely disinterested in his mother's fate, he abandoned her forever. She ended up in the streets, and the scenes were dramatic and repulsive in realism. Agenor, who had seen Serene at first gradually became troubled to the point of so much anguish, he said, no, master, no, a thousand times no. Please, enough for the love of God. No more, no more. The pain is too much. My poor mother, forgive me. Bring me a bit of relief, blah, blah, blah. So he's like so repented. I repent. Forgive me, mother. Forgive me, dear God. Da, da, da. The instructor slowly removed the luminous band from Agenor's head and said, Stand up, Agenor Penalva, he ordered. He stood up with his eyes be bewildered as if stricken by drunkenness, the visions, visions had ended. Inconsolable and drastically conscious of his wrongdoings, Agenor Penalva fell on his knees, covering his contorted face with clenched hands while tears continued to roll down his cheeks, overcome by the most impressive dismay I had ever seen in our institute until then. What about... Olivier de Guzman, how did he behave? Was he like rocking the baby? No, lesson for us. Olivier de Guzman did not try to console him. He merely helped him up and led him paternally back to his quarters. Olivier rearranged a large album on the study table, the pages of which were somewhat crumpled. On a blank page, the instructor wrote down a title and a subtitle whose depth touched our souls in an impulse of painful emotions. Subject, he wrote, fourth commandment of God's law. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. List of children's duties towards their parents. Then he left the room without saying a single word. Another pupil was waiting for him. A new task was requiring his devoted efforts. Father Anselmo switched off the apparatus. The visions had ended for us also. I could not contain myself, and almost angrily I asked, how can they leave that poor soul all alone in such a desperate condition? Camilo is asking. Does such an attitude really show charity on the part of the workers of this magnanimous legion? Who those who are responsible for watching over it? The doctors, Carlos and Roberto, smiled while Father and Samuel kindly appeased my indiscreet anxiety. The mentors know their words and their responsibilities in detail. They know exactly what they are doing. 
Moreover, who says the penitent is going to be left alone and without assistance? Isn't he under the maternal protection of Mother of Nazareth? When the gates of the fortress closed behind us as we prepared to return to our quarters, we could still hear resonating, distressingly in our stunning minds, the cries of the evil son amid the fierce convulsions of his remorse. Forgive me, Mother. Forgive me. Dear God, that's good therapy for us, moral therapy. That's something we should do with ourselves, with our children, mm -hmm. is to ask ourselves, these are the laws of life. If we observe, we have a tendency on something that is not good. Let us do this. Like Olivier de Guzman, take a piece of paper, write down our weakness in the sense of like what is to be strengthened and write down the duties to fulfill it. That's a good way to heal ourselves before we discarnate. If you observe a certain tendency, as we said last night, Seek for the virtues to be acquired. Let us do this exercise. If you find out, go to the gospel according to spiritism. Let's say, I'll give an example. Let's say we identify that uh, we, not other people, okay? That we have a problem in terms of patience. That we're not patient enough. Read about patience in the gospel. It's chapter 9, item 7. Courage, my friends. Christ is your model. He suffered more than any of you and had nothing for which to reproach himself. Da -da 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 -da. And write down how you can be more patient. This is the exercise that they do in the institute. And then you visualize yourself like, I can be more patient when... Somebody comes, do, does this, and instead of running away or doing this, or da, 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 I, uh, I will be doing that. When, da, 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 or I need to speak less. Okay. Uh, duty to be more charitable when talking, meaning not overloading people's minds with our... Ch -ch -ch -ch. So, I will be more dutiful and charitable, listening to people, not being judgmental, not sharing despair, not by doing this, that, and the other. And that's a good therapy for us. When we read this chapter, we need to feel the scripture. When we see a Janor Penalva, we may see us. We can't escape anymore. We need to face. We need to face who we are, because the more we have the courage to face it like Mary Magdalene, like Soul of Tarsus, they were courageous to face themselves as they have been. And they made a decision, I'm going to change it. And they worked hard to improve themselves. We're not able to remodel any house without seeing what we don't like anymore. If an architect come to your house and says, what do you want to change? And you say, I don't know. They're not going to be able to do anything. We need to look at the problem and say, I don't like this window and I need it to be this way. I don't like that, but I need to think how it needs to be. The same for us. We need to be courageous to look at ourselves and say, I want to remodel you. Like Vanessa, I want to remodel you. How so? I would like to see you more this way. I want to see you this way. And I start projecting, visualizing that good. That's what the spirits are teaching us. They are teaching us to transform old conditionings, putting reasoning to make us humans. We are learning to be human beings. Isn't this beautiful? 
Are you feeling more hopeful? Yes, less afraid, more courageous, hopeful to see the immense help that we have. How about if now in these last minutes we pray? Prayer is so sacred. For those who are suffering the value of suicide, who knows we were there, people were praying for us. Now it's our turn. Let us pray for them, shall we, friends? Join forces here. Let us play the Ave Maria and pray. Play it and pray. Okay? Let's do it. We're going to play it to be grateful to this beloved mother who never abandons us. I have here the Ave Maria. Here it comes. <laughs> Dear Mother Mary, we are learning a little bit more about your immense works. We cannot even imagine the vastness, non-stop legions of workers who are constantly rescuing those who are in need of a new opportunity of deep relief for their anguishes and pains who are we to judge we are also former criminals who knows even suicides we have erred erred in the in the face of our beloved God, committed mistakes, hurt people's lives. But now, we potentially know better and would like to team up with you. Humbly uniting our forces here from city to city, state to state. In the United States and several friendly countries around the world, right now, whether live or on demand, we join our thoughts and feelings, praying for those who are anguished, in cruel pain, feeling the coldness of their suicide, the repetition of the feelings and the images, and the many lives that are still tormented and tormenting them. We pray that our crumbs of good wishes are multiplied by your immense love and reach them out as we visualize your blue blanket of love warming each one of them warming them up and lifting up their hopes thank you for your love, for inviting us to join you. What an honor. We thank you for caring for us as well, for knowing our pains and sorrows created by our own selves. May your love for us also bring relief to all of our hearts.
and so be it. It feels good and our hopes are lifted. Tomorrow, there's more on Lifting Hope with Yvonne Pereira and Camilo in a journey to our deep selves. Everything we do remains inside of us. Let us do good deeds to increase the love of life and go on pressing on doing the good always. Thank you, friends. Here at Kardec Radio, we are always nourishing our souls together. Hopefully tomorrow we'll be back with more on Lifting Hope. Thank you, friends. Until tomorrow, God willing. <music>